know, I didn't know that, and Daniel didn't know that. How many of you actually did know that before we just sang it? I thought a few of you, well, just one, wow, you sang that so well, I figured some of you had to have known it already. That was beautiful singing, and you all are very fast learners. Uh, younger ones, you're dismissed to your class at this time, and we're going to continue our series here in Hebrews chapter number 12. Our verses this morning are verses 12 and 13, and the theme is this, God's commands for his chastened children. We've been speaking of God's discipline, and the right way to think of discipline is what? What word should we think of as we read that over and over in Hebrews 12? Training. Training. It's what God is doing for us. It's not hurting us. It's not just punishing us, though that certainly can be the case at times. God's ultimate overarching purpose is our training. And now God gives us commands. Let's read these verses together, starting in verse number 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Our response to even this title as we're speaking of this, God's commands for his chastened children, our response might be one of surprise, maybe even indignation. Can't we sometimes harbor this feeling, this resentment within us? I, I spoke before of how sometimes I would feel after my parents disciplined me, and then afterwards they'd give me this explanation, this talk afterwards. And I thought, haven't I been through enough? I mean, I just got disciplined. I was just spanked. I, I don't want to lecture on top of it. Can we just move on? Sometimes can't we feel that way after we've been chastened, after we've been disciplined, after we've been rebuked and corrected? We just say, just leave me alone. I want to kind of wallow in self-pity, kind of nurse my own wounds. I, I want to be left alone. My parents had something more in store for me than just hurting me, didn't they? Why would they give me a lecture after they disciplined? They wanted it to accomplish his purpose. It's not just associate disobedience with pain. He was saying, I want you to learn a valuable lesson through this, and I want you to grow, and I want you to change. And God's doing that same thing here for us when he gives us these commands. It's not just God adding insult to injury. That sometimes I would have felt from my parents. Don't have this, this idea as we work through this passage. I had a boss that I worked for. Of all the different bosses that I've worked for, someone said, you learn more from a bad boss than a good boss. I hope so, because every day working for this boss was difficult. He wasn't trying to be cruel. He wasn't trying to be unkind. I think he just lacked um, common sense. He, he lacked uh, personal skills of interacting with people because he was a boss that was just a taskmaster, but didn't realize that as he's just driving and driving and driving, he's discouraging and defeating us that worked for him. And one day as I worked for him, I was just completely exhausted. And I've always been just kind of this happy-go-lucky, but at this point, I was just exhausted. And so I'm sitting down, and I'm just having a hard time in my own spirit just being positive. And he sits down next to me, and he goes, what's your problem? Well, I couldn't tell him, well, it's you. <laughs> it's, the, it's the way that you're treating us. It's the way that you're making this workplace so unbearable. I couldn't say anything. And so I just said, nothing. And he goes, well, fix it. He said, smile. And I, I just thought... You're completely missing everything. What, what I need is not a lecture. What I need is a boss that lovingly understands what his employees are going through and making it bearable in the workplace. But we can, we can see that kind of thing and sometimes communicate that in our own minds. This is what God is saying, and it's not. God is not saying, I've just chastened you, now smile, and giving us these commands just on top of injury. That's not how we should approach this passage. So our response to even this title of God's commands for his chastened children shouldn't be this. God, are, are you unaware of what I've been going through? Do you not understand my affliction? Are you being unsympathetic or unkind? We can feel this way when we read this commands, following, chastening. How can this be? And our initial impression is why not an explanation for this chastening, right? If I understood why I'm suffering, then I could handle it better and we can say, but you know, Job, if he had understood why everything was happening, he could have processed things, and we don't have assurance that Job ever fully understood what was going on in his trials, but in our own trials, we say, God, if you could just explain it to me, if you could give me some insight as to why this suffering and affliction, I'd rather an explanation than commands following chastening. I'd rather encouragement to follow this chastening. Or at very least, how about some time off? Could I just have a little bit of a break? 
Time to heal, time to recover, time to process things. Why is God following chastening with commands? Because God is saying to us, again, this chastening is training. You're being trained through this affliction. So I want you to learn what I want you to learn through this to accomplish his purpose. I don't want you just hurting. I don't want you just suffering. I want you growing. And that's the reason for these commands. Now God's saying, first of all, I want you to respond to this training by understanding it correctly. And that's what we looked at last week in verses 4 through 11. That's what these verses are all about. Understand this training and respond to God's training in this kind of way. Again, not to re-preach it, but just to remind ourselves, this is all building. Sometimes as we read passages in Scripture, we can kind of do that in isolation, can't we? On to the next verse and forget what we just read. And to understand this passage, we have to see how it all works together. God has just said, this is how you should think of my training in your life. This is how you should think of the afflictions in your life. Don't exaggerate them. Don't misattribute them. Don't ignore them. Don't be defeated by them, but instead understood that, understand that it's proof of my love. It's proof of our relationship. So we should submit to God's chastening, God's discipline, God's training, and understand the purpose for his training. And now God is building on this right understanding. Now that we think this way, Lord willing, hopefully think this way when affliction comes into our lives, in light of all this, Verse 12 begins, wherefore. You see that? It's this connecting word. This word is also translated, therefore. On the basis of all of this, in response to all of this, in light of all of this, understanding correctly about God's affliction that he's brought into our lives, wherefore. And then God gives us his two imperatives in this text. Do you see them? What are the two commands that God gives us? Wherefore do what? Lift the hands, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And what else? And make straight paths for your feet. These are the two imperatives, the two commands that God gives his chastened children. God says, look, you've just gone through trials and affliction and suffering. Now here's my imperative for you. Lift up and make straight. And again, this is, not being, this is not God being uncaring or uncompassionate. This is God being lovingly intentional. God is not unaware of our condition after being chastened. Instead, God is speaking to our need. He's speaking to our condition directly. He's not ignoring it. These commands are in direct response to how we feel after we've been chastened. How are we described here? after having been chastened by God. Do you see the description? God says, this is exactly where you are, and what is our condition after God chastens us? Hands, which hang down. Our hands have just gone slack. Our strength is drained out of us. Have you ever felt this way? I just don't have the energy to put one foot in front of the other. I'm just completely spent. I'm completely exhausted. I don't even have the strength to lift my hand. We don't even have the energy to use our hands. God says, this is how you can feel after my chastening. Is this feeling wrong? No. This is a natural response. After we've gone through trials, this is how we feel. And God understands. He says, this is where you are. And I care, I understand, I know. God's chastening has left us feeling completely weak and powerless, spent and exhausted. How else are we described? See what it says next? Feeble knees. You see, this is a very strange reference. Why is it that we're talking about hands and knees? Well, these are just partial components of an explanation of the whole. This is how that we feel. What's interesting is the word that's used here, feeble, is an interesting word that's used only four other times in the Greek New Testament. And every single time that this word feeble occurs, it's referring to people who are paralyzed. Does it give shape and meaning to this word? 
He's not just saying your knees are weak, but you can go on and so suck it up and just continue. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. No, he's saying, look, you have hands that are powerless. You can't even lift them. And you have knees, you have legs that are paralyzed. God is describing our condition following his chastening. He's saying, you're absolutely powerless. It's not just weak. It's not just feeble. What would you say to a paralyzed person? Well, just try harder to walk. You just need more effort. No, you would say that person that's paralyzed can do what? Absolutely nothing. And God says, this is how you will feel after I have chastened you. You're absolutely powerless and you are paralyzed. You have a complete inability to do anything. God is not being unkind here. He's not saying you have no hope. God is saying this is the natural response. God's not being harsh. Instead, God is communicating his loving compassion in his understanding of our condition. I know where you are. I know how you feel. I care about how you feel. That's what God is saying here. I know I'm completely understanding of your hurt. Isn't that what you really want from someone? You ever get hurt and you explain it to someone and they say, well, why, why'd you do that? <laughs> I don't need you to tell me where I went wrong and that's my fault for getting injured. What do I want when I'm hurt? I just want you to say, I know how you feel and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're going through this. Not you should have paid more attention. That's the worst, isn't it? When I'm hurting, I didn't come to you for a lecture. I want you to care about me. I want you to feel this hurt with me. I don't need an answer. I don't need a fix. I just want you to feel. I want you to sit down next to me and just understand what I'm going through and put your arm around me and just say that you care. That's what I want. That's what's so hard for us as men, isn't it? When there's a problem, you know what I want to do? Just fix it. <laughs> I, I can't stand just standing and, and just listening to something. No, I got to do. I got to act. I got to be. And that's not always the right response, is it? When my little girls get hurt, you know what they want? Not a lecture. Not an explanation of how to avoid it next time. You know what they want? A hug. Just hold me and say you care and that it's going to be okay. That's all they want. And God says, that's what you need too. And I'm meeting that need through this passage. I understand where you are. God is saying, I'm completely understanding of your hurt. Aren't you glad? There are times that other people might never understand or ever be able to really meet this need of care and compassion. But God does. That's what the Bible says. He's this perfect, Jesus Christ is this perfect high priest that feels everything that we feel. Aren't you glad? He understands our need, our hurt. God says, I'm intimately aware of your needs. I know what this chastening has felt like in your life. I know how this affliction and suffering has caused you pain and hurt you. So God is saying in this passage, so in light of that, here's what I'm prescribing. These commands are not that tone-deaf boss that's just saying, smile. <laughs> this is God saying, look, I know what this affliction has meant in time in the word of God. After God's chastened me, I run to the word. I need the word of God in my life. This is how I'm strengthened. It's reading our Bibles. And that's what the New Testament is all about. Though our outward man perish, our inward man is what? Is renewed day by day. How does that happen? Not just automatically. You're not automatically strengthened spiritually. You can't just say, well, since I've been a Christian for this long, God's going to do the strengthening and I just sit and wait. God says, you've got personal responsibility here. You've got to spend time with me. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to get alone with God. What examples do we have of this in our New Testament? As you read through the Gospels, who do you find doing this best? Christ himself. If Jesus himself saw his need of spending time with God in prayer, having gone through all that he suffered, how much more do we? You could argue, but Jesus is God, yes, and he's also man, and he's demonstrating for us how we go through trials and afflictions, and it's through personal time spent with God. That's how you strengthen yourself. And so if you say, right now, I'm just spiritually empty, 
My spiritual bank account is just zero. Maybe it's overdrawn. What do I do? You spend time with God. I mean, it's good to come to church and it's good to be here collectively, but there's no substitute for your personal time in the word of God. If you say, I'm weak, where do I strengthen myself? It's the word of God. Get alone with God and spend time in his word, reading and praying. This again is not a suggestion, is it? It's a command. God says, you need strength, and this is the only place you'll find it. This is how we strengthen our inner man. This is how we strengthen ourselves spiritually. We spend time alone with God. You know what's amazing? Somehow we can have this disconnect in our minds. We can say to God, why am I so weak? Why am I so paralyzed? Why am I so unable to even lift my hands? And why am I so exhausted? And God says, why aren't you spending time with me? We can almost blame God for our weakness, can't we? When God says the, the secret, the answer is you come, you read, you pray. There's a responsibility here. You and I must be spending time with God in order to be strengthened. We must spend time reading the Bible in order to be strengthened. And God says, this is what I'm prescribing for you. What kind of a patient are you and I? Will we listen to the doctor's prescription. Or will we say, you know what, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. I'm going to go my own way. Or do we say, like we do sometimes, well, I started taking the prescription and then I felt better. And so now that I feel better, I'm just going to stop. You ever do that? And all of a sudden you get worse and you go, oh, I shouldn't have stopped. No, finish God's prescription. How long does God's prescription last? Your entire life, this is not just saying, okay, right when an affliction happens, then read the Bible. Then when things get easier, stop reading the Bible. No, you and I desperately need the word of God every day of our lives. And God says, this is what I'm prescribing. You have to be in my word. You have to strengthen yourself in this way. The world resorts to all different types of coping mechanisms, doesn't it? As you look at the lost people around us and how they cope with trials and difficulties in their lives. Going through painful, stressful situations, the world tries to numb its pain through alcohol. It tries to distract itself through entertainment. It tries to please or satisfy itself through sin. But God says, Christian, when you have endured my discipline, none of these responses are what I'm calling you to. Don't respond the way that the world does. Okay, I've just got to numb myself to it. I've got to entertain myself away from it. I've got to distract myself. I've got to make myself happy through my own means. God says none of those are the responses of a Christian in a time of affliction. That's not the right response. God says, I'm calling you to spend time with me. I'm calling you to spend time in my word. So don't distract yourself. Don't numb yourself. Don't shut down. God's saying, don't shut me out. Can't we sometimes do that? Like that child that's been spanked and just says, I just want to wallow in self-pity and just nurse my wounds because no one knows and no one cares. God says, no, that's not the right response of a believer. Come to me. Cling to me. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon that said, I've come to kiss the wave that drives me against the rock of ages. Can you have that response to your affliction? God, you're using this to drive me to you. Can you respond to affliction this way? This is how we're strengthened. God's saying, don't shut me out. Instead, come to me. Come to me with your burdens. Come to me with your pain. And come to me with your hurt. Spend time with me. Spend time in my word. And as a result, you'll be strengthened. Can you do that? Can you listen to what God is prescribing here and say, this is the solution to my weakness and my paralysis and my powerlessness. It's I need the Bible. I need time in God's word. If you are not spending increased personal time in the word of God, you're not responding to God's chastening God's way. That hurts a little bit to hear, doesn't it? It's true. If when God chastens you, it doesn't result in more time in the word of God, then you're not responding to God's chastening correctly. What else does God prescribe for us in this passage? In response to our need. Well, what's the next problematic condition that God finds us in after having endured his chastening? What's next? Do you see the next thing? Hands which hang down on the feeble knees. God says, okay, strengthen yourself. In verse 13, what's the next problem? 
Do you see it? Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Who's lame? We are, having endured affliction. What is this phrase communicating? What is our next area of need? God's chastening in our lives, God's discipline of us has left us lame. We're limping. And so what is our inclination? When we are lame, when we are limping, when we're feeling like we're out of joint, our tendency is to turn out of the way. That's the concern. Do you see that? It's not just that we'll be lame, but as we're lame, then we say, you know what? This pain is not good, so I'm going to look for another pathway. I'm going to turn out of the way. And God says that's a wrong response, but that's the response that all of us can have to suffering. Not maliciously, but simply out of desperation, out of a sense of self-preservation. I want this pain to end, so I'm going to look for a way out. We're suffering. We're hurting. So this is our inclination. I want to find a solution, my way. I want a way out. This is our condition after having endured God's painful disciplinary training. We're going to be looking for an escape, another path. We're looking for a way that would be outside of the pathway that God has prescribed for us. Do we have any Old Testament examples of this that we've looked at? going through a time of testing and pain and affliction and coming up with your own pathway. Can you think of any examples that we've studied, even in Hebrews 11, that demonstrated that? Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Elijah, Sarah. I mean, every single time, this is exactly what they were doing. I mean, Sarah is a perfect example when she says, look, God made this promise. It hasn't come true. So she goes to Abraham. We've got to figure out our own way. What's she doing? She's lame. She's limping. She's saying, look, physically speaking, there's not a whole lot of hope for us, so I'm going to choose another path. Turning out of the way. And God says, that's wrong. That's a wrong response. And God is saying, don't turn away. This is your inclination. But here's my second command. Here's your tendency is to turn away. Here's my prescription for that. How do you not turn away? You intentionally make straight paths for your feet. What does this say? Keep going. Keep going straight. Advance with a straight course. Don't be deterred. Don't take any detours. Follow on in committed obedience to Christ. Unswerving. Pain makes, makes us rethink things, doesn't it? You can say, you know what? I've got every ambition to run two miles today. And then you start that run, then all of a sudden you'll feel a cramp. All of a sudden you'll feel some new pain in your knee that you've never felt before. And what's your response? Well, look, I was going to run two miles, but now that there's this pain, I'm going to reevaluate my plan. And aren't we good lawyers? We're the best lawyers because you know what we'll say to ourselves? I'm not quitting because I don't have ambition. I'm quitting because I'm making the right decision for my health. This pain is, is a warning sign that I've got to pay attention to. It's just saying that two miles is good, just not today. I'll do two miles tomorrow. And then guess what happens when we go to run two miles tomorrow? Another pain crops up and what do we say? I really need to listen to this. This is my body telling me that this is not a right course of action. And we're so good at arguing ourselves into an, another path, aren't we? I'm just going to find another way to do this. You know, I, I know I set my alarm for 6 o'clock this morning, but I just need more sleep. And so I'm going to wake up at 7 instead. And it's going to be, we're all the time making new paths. And God is saying, you can't do that spiritually. You might do that physically. You might do that in all these other things. You cannot get away with that spiritually. When God says pain is in your life, he's not saying, so find another path. He's saying, keep going. Don't quit. Make straight paths for your feet and follow unswervingly, even when it involves suffering. This is counterintuitive because every fiber of our being is screaming at us. This doesn't make sense. And God's saying, this is where the life of faith enters in. When there's pain involved, when it hurts, when it doesn't make sense, keep going straight. That's God's prescription for us. 
Are there any biblical examples of this kind of committed resolve in the face of pain? We, we talk all the time about turning away. We just named a whole lot of examples of those that responded incorrectly. Can you think of a positive example of someone who continued in, in the face of suffering, in the face of pain? Joseph. Good. Can you think of another? Christ. <laughs> Amen. The perfect example. Abraham. Paul. There's positive examples, too, and one that I was drawn to just because of the wording of Hebrews was Jacob. We don't always think of Jacob as positive examples, as a positive example, but Genesis 32, this is where he's going to come back and face his brother that he's fled from. Do you remember this? And he sent everyone ahead of him. You say, how cowardly. No, it's intentional. It's planning. Verse 22, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the four Jabbok. Verse 23, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had, sent over everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him. We know this is more than just a man, isn't it? We believe this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. We would call this a Christophany. There wrestled a man with him. How long? Until the breaking of the day. We're quick to gloss over this. Wrestling is exhausting. It's amazing. The, the wrestling coaches that want to train their students have them run miles and miles and miles. And you say, why? Because a wrestling match is only a few minutes. You ever wrestled for a few minutes? It's awful. When I was at Northland, when I was in college, I, I enjoyed working out. I love lifting weights. And because of how, how I, I could lift a lot, of weight for, a lot of weight for my weight, the wrestling coach wanted me on the team. He said, I want you to come and wrestle with us. But then he said, but I want you to get down to the 135-pound weight class. At that point, I weighed 150 pounds. He's asking me to drop all of that weight to get into this class. And I'm saying, no, thank you. But I said, but I will come to the wrestling practices. And so I went to, to a couple of those wrestling practices. They were awful. A couple of minutes, and I'm gasping. And I could run. I mean, I've always been able to run a couple of miles and just feel like it's fine. I went a couple of minutes, and I was gasping like I've never gasped before. I was like, what is this? I'd much rather run cross country. I'd much rather do anything than this exertion, this physical exhaustion that comes in just a few minutes. And what's Jacob doing? How long does he wrestle with Christ? All night. What does that speak to? His committed resolve. There's already a lot of pain going on. I mean, after a few minutes he spent, he continues all night long in this wrestling match. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, Who's this he? When Christ saw that he prevailed not against him, Jacob, is this saying that Jacob was stronger than Christ? No, this is, this is Christ saying, I'm testing Jacob to his limit, but I'm seeing that he's not giving up. He's not quitting. When, when I taught PE class, there were always those guys that wanted to prove themselves. And it was funny because they're, you, know, you could always spot it. They're seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, and they've hit this growth spurt. They're all of a sudden getting stronger, and so they think they're top dog. And there will always be these guys that want to prove it to me. They'd always want to wrestle. And I always loved it, so I'd always wrestle with them. Somehow I never got in trouble at the office. I was always waiting for that phone call. I'd wrestle the guys right there on the gym floor. There was this one guy that I wrestled. At that time, I think he was eighth grade, and he was almost six feet tall and just stout. And I, I pinned him, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up. And I said, just, just tap out. And he wouldn't tap out. And he was saying, I will pass out before I'll tap out. And I was like, I'm going to kill this kid. And I was laughing and I talked to his dad and I said, why didn't he quit? He said, that's how he is. He just, he never stops. He, even though he's pinned and even though he's completely defeated, he won't stop. That can be a very good thing. It can be a very bad thing if it's about the wrong thing. It can be a very good thing. And that's what Jacob is demonstrating. I'm not going to quit. I'm not giving up. And when Christ sees this in this match of wrestling, what does he do? He touches the hollow of his thigh. What is he doing? He's crippling him. He's adding to this pain that he's already experienced, this pain of physical exhaustion. And Christ says, I'm going to step it up a notch and I'm going to cripple you. That will make you quit. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he gave up. Is that what it says? As he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. 
This is Christ saying, look, let me go. It's morning. I'm going to leave. And what does Jacob say? I will not let you go unless you bless me. I am this committed. I'm not giving up. And I don't care how much physical exhaustion or physical pain there is. God, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm not turning aside to the left or to the right until you bless me. I know that you've got something good for me in store, and so I'm not quitting until you give it to me. And he said unto him, Christ says unto Jacob, what is thy name? Why? He didn't know. He's about to teach him something. He said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men. What is this? This is that blessing that in spite of all this pain and affliction that Jacob persevered for and has prevailed. You didn't quit. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Isn't that interesting? He said, what's your name? Was Jacob, okay, now what's your name? Tell me, I pray, thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. This isn't your place to ask me questions. And he blessed him. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. Did he know that he wasn't just wrestling with a man? Of course he did. And that's where there's this committed perseverance. This affliction that he's going through, he's saying, look, this isn't just physical and it's not just for no purpose. This is God testing me and I won't turn aside. Can we have that kind of resolve in the face of our affliction and our suffering? You know what we would say? You know what? I'm tired. You know what? I've got to work tomorrow. You know what? It's been long enough. If God wants to bless me, he'll just bless me. You know what? There's physical pain. God doesn't want me to be limping the rest of my life. I'm just going to quit. Is that the right response to God? God wants us to prevail. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. What is this saying? Well, God blessed him and everything went away. He never had a problem again. How long do you think he limped? I think the rest of his life. Now, the Bible doesn't say that, but I think it's implied by what follows. He halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day. The Israelites still today, when they, when they eat an animal, they say, we're not touching this part. Why? Because we're remembering what God did, what Jacob endured, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. God is saying in this passage, this is what I'm looking for. Not just in Jacob. I'm looking for this in you, in your life. More than just looking for this. This is what I'm calling you to. You don't get a pass and say, well, I'm just not a Jacob. So I just don't handle affliction the same way. God says, all of you have to respond to affliction the same way. This is what I'm calling you to. Live this way. After I've disciplined you, strengthen yourself in my word and straighten your path to follow me committedly. Don't turn away. Don't look for an easy way out. Make your path straight. And what is the end result? What does God promise in the end? Do you see the promise at the end of verse 13? Let it rather be healed. The end result is not just that we will be strengthened or that our paths will be straightened, but the end result of all of God's training is this. Healing. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. And just as God has not been speaking of physical weakness, God is not just speaking of physical healing. That's what sometimes we could want, right? No doubt that's what Jacob wanted, right? God, now that you've blessed me, how about you heal this hip of mine? <laughs> that, by the way, you touched. Does Jacob pray that? Well, maybe he did. We don't have it recorded, but does God answer that? No, because God's ultimate plan for you is not just physical health. God's plan for you is not just physical well-being and physical monetary good things. God has more in store for you than just physical blessing. God is saying the end result of all of this training is spiritual healing, spiritual health, 
spiritual well-being. And that's something that Jacob was willing to limp for. That's something that we should be willing to suffer for. I'm willing to exchange my my physical ease for spiritual health, for spiritual well-being. And that's God's purpose for these afflictions and these trials. This has been God's purpose for us all along. This is God's purpose for trials. God's purpose really for saving us in the first place. God's plan and God's purpose for you is that you would be spiritually well. Spiritually whole spiritually complete. Remember, that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Look, you think you're well. It's fine. I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick and to call sinners to repentance. And you know who the sick are? All of us. All of us have this spiritual sickness that Christ came to heal. And that's his purpose in saving us. And that's his continued purpose in disciplining us. So what's our application? How should we respond to this passage? We should see these two imperatives as two prescriptions that directly speak to our needs. These are God's two commands to his chastened children. Number one, you are weak and you are powerless. So strengthen yourselves. Read my word. Spend time with me. Will you do this? When you go through your times of suffering and times of affliction, instead of shutting God out, would you run to him? Would you say, like Spurgeon, I've learned to kiss the wave that drives me against the rock of ages? God's second command, you are tempted to wander. Straighten your path. Will you acknowledge this, God? When I go through affliction, my tendency is to want to turn aside from obedience. But God, would you please help me to go straight? Would you help me to not turn aside from following you? Can you respond to God this way? Will you accept these two imperatives? And in doing so, will you experience the spiritual healing that God intends to work in your life? Let's close in prayer. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for us. I pray that we would see all of these things as demonstrations of how much you love us that you love us enough to train us. And in this training, your, your whole purpose is to provide us with spiritual health and well-being. I pray that even this morning, we would acknowledge our tendency to neglect you, to neglect your word when we are hurting. I pray that we would confess and forsake this tendency and that we would run to you, that we would spend committed time in prayer and in our Bible reading. I pray that we would also see that our tendency after having been afflicted is to turn aside, to leave the path of obedience and following you. And I pray that we would confess and forsake that. I pray that we would make straight paths, that we would follow you committedly, that we would know the spiritual health that you intend for us. In Jesus' name, amen.